So yesterday we were in the process of uh, um, com performing this localization computation of uh, uh, partition function. of uh, uh, two-dimensional n equal two comma two gauge theories and uh, uh, here really we are restricting to vector uh, and chiral multiplets uh, on uh, the untwisted and round S2. And uh, uh, let me rewrite uh, this is the bosonic part of the two actions that we wrote yesterday, as this will be useful. So we wrote the Young-Mills action, uh, so super Young-Mills action. Uh, I don't write the gauge coupling because anyway, there is, in, there is no dependence on that. So this sigma 2 uh, was uh, somehow the imaginary part of sigma, but really it's complexified. Then there was this quartic interaction, which is standard. And then we wrote also the matter action, uh, so the action for the kinetic term for chiral multiplets. And uh, well these chiral multiplets are in some representation, so implicit there is a contraction of uh, suitable indices. This small r uh, was the r charge, while big r was the radius of the sphere. And this f, which is different from this f, so this is the auxiliary complex scalar in the chiral multiplet, uh, <laughs> while this with two indices, one, two is the field strength. Okay, so, um, so we discussed these two terms in particular, well here there are plus fermions. Um, and uh, um, okay, so we discussed these two terms, in particular we say these are Q exact for a certain supercharge that uh, uh, we, we, we choose. So we have uh, four at our disposal, but we choose one out of two here, one out of two, of two here. Okay, so what about uh, uh, the interactions in the theory? Um, so first of all, as we said, we have uh, superpotential interactions. And in general, superpotential interactions, as we said, this is similar, uh, this is exactly the same as in four dimensional n equal two. We have uh, some holomorphic function of chiral multiplets. So this function itself is a chiral multiplet, and so uh, it has a f term. Uh, and so we just add the f term of this chiral multiplet to the action. And this works because the supersymmetry variation is a total derivative. So once integrating the action is, uh, is zero. So in general, the, the, the Lagrangian is just, uh, uh, we take the f term of this particular color multiplet. Uh, and if you work out what this, uh, what, this color, what this top component of this color multiplet is, this is the same expression that you have on flat space. There are the derivative of the superpotential with respect to the various chiral fits that are in here. 
and then there are some uh, um, Yukawa-like uh, interactions. Um, so the nice thing is that it turns out that this also is uh, Q-exact. And so once again, uh, in general, of course, this is, uh, let's say we choose a poly standard polynomial function, it will depend on various coefficients, but there will not be a dependence of this patinter that we're going to compute on the coefficients in the superpotential. Uh, this does not mean that the theory is completely independent uh, uh, from the superpotential, because the superpotential should have R charge 2, we need the R symmetry to, do, to construct our background, uh, and so of course this poses some constraints on the choices we can have for the R charges, but this is only remnant of the dependence on the superpotential. Is it, is it clear? Okay. Uh, then we have a twisted superpotential. And the story is similar, this is some other function, let me use this calligraphic W, of twisted chiral multiplets. Um, and, uh, um, and this also should be, yes, should be a holomorphic function. Now, let me restrict to the case in which this is linear. So, uh, uh, well, if it is linear, the only, well, there can be a constant, but the constant doesn't affect uh, the theory. So uh, the linear term contains a coefficient, so let me parameterize it uh, by some real part and some imaginary part. Uh, so if you work out uh, uh, what you get in the, into the Lagrangian, uh, what you get is a, a, the complexified Fayetiliopoulos term. So this, uh, if you wish, this real part controls uh, uh, a linear term proportional to the D term that you put in the action. This is called the Fayetiliopoulos term. And the imaginary part controls a topological term. This is just uh, the field strength integrated on two sphere. We are in two dimensions. So we have such a, a topological term. And this is called, uh, what well, this is called the theta angle because the theory is invariant under shift of this angle by 2 pi. This is very similar to the term f wedge f that you have in four dimensions. Uh, uh, and uh, of course we could consider a higher, uh, higher, um, higher powers of this sigma, but let's consider this very simple case. Uh, and the interesting thing now is that, that this term is not Q exact. <coughs> Uh, so, in fact, the, our, uh, our partition function will depend on this, on this parameter, or more generally on the various parameters that we have in this twisted superpotential. Okay. And then finally, we had uh, uh, twisted masses. And we commented various times on these, uh, on these twisted masses. So just to, to repeat once again, these twisted masses are related to flavor symmetries. In fact, they take values in the um, um, Cartan subalgebra of the, of the flavor symmetry group. And that corresponds to the fact that when you have a symmetry, you can couple the theory to external vector multiplet, and there is a scalar in the external vector multiplet. If you give it an expectation value, and you work out what are the effects in the Lagrange, and this is corresponds to turning on some masses. Um, now, these masses, in fact, um, uh, are associated to, to, the, to the central charges of the algebra, and so these twisted masses deform uh, the supersymmetry algebra, they appear uh, central charge in the supersymmetry algebra, um, and so because of this reason, the answer will also depend on these twisted masses. Okay, now, uh, as you said, these twisted masses, so we gave expectation values to these fields in the vector multiplet. In order to keep the theory supersymmetric, we'll have to impose 
uh, that uh, the, the variation of the gravitino in, the, in this flavor or background vector, ma uh, vector fields is zero. Uh, but in fact, as we'll see in a moment, this condition will be, uh, I mean, we will have to discuss this condition when we discuss the localization. So let me postpone for a few minutes uh, what, what are the solution to this. Okay. So, uh, so, um, okay, so now we want to proceed with our localization computation. And we say those two terms are uh, Q exact. Um, so, in fact, we can try to use these this very same uh, terms uh, to perform the localization. Uh, so now we should check if they have the nice properties. Uh, but in fact, they are both, so as I said, they are Q-exact. They're also Q-closed. This is the supersymmetric action on the, on the theory. But anyway, you can check it if, if you wish explicitly. Uh, this one here, along the, along the contour that we chose, so we chose the, 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 the trivial, if you want, the, the, the obvious contour, which is just take real fields or, or fields which are complex conjugates. Uh, and, and then this is manifestly positive. This is a, um, a sum of uh, positive terms. Uh, of course, let me stress once again, if you don't impose a contour, uh, there is no way that this is going to be positive, of course, because with complex fields, they, they will take generic values. But on the real contour, this is uh, positive, so this is OK. Uh, now, this one here, while the real part of the bosonic part is positive, uh, because, uh, so if you don't look at these two terms, uh, well, this is, this is positive, as long as uh, this one here uh, is a positive real part, uh, as long as uh, the R charge is between uh, 0 and 2, and so we will perform the computation in this, uh, in this case here. Um, well, in fact, it turns out that this uh, takes the canonical form. So if you do this thing that you sum over the fermions of uh, Q psi, dagger psi, uh, you, uh, and you act with Q on that, you get precisely this. Uh, this one is not in the canonical form. So if you prefer, and this is related to the fact that there is this imaginary part which is not uh, positive. Um, so if you prefer, you could instead choose, uh, construct the canonical form. It's slightly different from this, but it would be good enough. Um, but we can use this. OK. Uh, so now we are interested in the zeros of these, uh, of these functions, because we localize to, uh, to the zeros of the, of the real part of the bosonic part. Uh, but now, as you see, this is, uh, this is very simple. Because, so from the gauge part, we just set to zero each of the squares. So, uh, so, um, The equations are just that uh, f is related to sigma 2, d is related to sigma 1. Uh, these derivatives of sigma 1 and sigma 2 are 0, as well as the commutator. Uh, and then, once you have fixed this, um, uh, again, if we are in this, in this, in this region for the other charges, uh, then also the other, uh, setting to zero the real part of the other one is very simple, and you just get that it is, uh, this is, is, is trivial. Everything is zero in the matter sector. Um, so, okay, so this, this equation is uh, zero. So these equations are very simple to solve because sigma 1 and sigma 2 uh, commute, so we can uh, diagonalize them simultaneously. Then also f and d will be diagonal, so everything is diagonal. And then these derivatives becomes the standard uh, derivative. It's just telling us that uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are constant, and so everything is constant. And so what we find is that this BPS locus, where we localize, is extremely simple. Uh, it doesn't always have to be the case, uh, but in this case we are lucky, so it is. 
Um, should, should I worry that there is a minus in front of the commutator of sigma 1, sigma 2? No, because uh, if you want the commutator is imaginary, so sigma 1, sigma 2 dagger is uh, sigma 2 dagger, sigma 1. Uh, now, if these are Hermitian, you get minus sigma 1, sigma 2. Uh, so the commutator is imaginary. And so that term is positive with the minus. OK, any, any other question? OK, so, so we can easily parameterize this, uh, this uh, modular space. Uh, as I said, this is not always the case. Modular space in general might be still, uh, I mean, even if it's finite dimension, it could be quite complicated, but in this case, it's not. So we can parameterize this d, which is sigma 1 over r, by some constant, which we can call a. Uh, so this a will be dimensionless. f12, which is equal to sigma 2 over r, is also a constant. Let me call it uh, some m, so small m. Uh, and uh, so these are uh, diagonal. So they are in the joint, but they are diagonal. Now, the only constraint is that this is a field strength. So there is a quantization condition on a compact space that the integral on the, on the sphere should be quantized. And so the condition is the GNO quantization condition that if we integrate on S2 this F12, um, which gives us M, um, so this M should be GNO quantized. So the condition is that uh, so m is in the algebra. So you exponentiate it, you get something in the group. And the condition is that this is the identity in the group. Um, so in particular, so for instance, if you take u1, uh, this is just telling us that this m is integer. Okay? Uh, but more generally, uh, this condition depends not just on the algebra, depends on the group. If you change the group and the algebra is the same, this condition changes. OK, so this is our space uh, of BPS configuration. So our path integral reduces essentially to an integral over A, uh, which is real, and the sum over this, uh, this, this lattice of magnetic charges. Um, and then what we have to compute? Well, we have to compute the classical action and the one loop determinant. So the classical action is very simple. As we said, the only uh, term which is not Q-exact is uh, this twisted superpotential. So essentially, you have to evaluate this uh, very simple action on these configurations, and you get something very simple. And then the next, uh, the next task is to compute one loop determinants. So, sorry, small yes. a is diagonal metric? Yes. Uh, OK. So, uh, so how do we compute these one loop determinants? So, um, so essentially what we have to do, we take uh, for each of these uh, points of these configurations, uh, we take the localization term, we expand that quadratic order around that point. So the feature is that we have, the, again, the space of field configurations. We have the special set of special configurations. For each point, we should expand the quadratic action, a quadratic level, and um, well, compute the data, multiply all the all the um, eigenvalues. I'm sorry, could you lower the middle board a bit? The shape makes it impossible to see the last thing you wrote, the SFI. Yes, uh, but it's not it's not very important. Uh, I kept that one will be more useful. So, I mean, okay, I can do that, but uh, like this. OK, um, so how do we do that? 
uh, well, the most pedestrian way is that, uh, uh, so it's a ratio of, of determinants for the bosonic sector and the fermionic sector, and uh, uh, we do it, uh, so we've compute the full spectrum in each, in each sector. Now let me stress well, one of the advantages of working off shell is that each, uh, so for each multiplet, uh, we have essentially a separate problem, and so we can uh, compute for different multiplets the, the, the contribution. Now, um, in general, this is a very hard problem to compute the spectrum, because these operators, morally speaking, are a Laplacian or a Dirac operator, okay, these are generalization thereof, but say this is what they are. In general, we don't know how to compute the spectrum of these operators, this is a very hard problem. Uh, we are able to do that if you have a special situation with a lot of symmetry. Like here you have the round S2, so as, as I will show, this is doable, but if I already have some squashed sphere or some more general space, in general we don't know how to compute the spectrum. It's a very hard problem. Um, luckily, as I said, there are many cancellations uh, in between these two, um, the, 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 the spectrum, the spectra of these two operators, and so one is really interesting just in computing the eigenvalues that do not cancel. And there are more sophisticated methods to compute just uh, those uh, eigenvalues that do not cancel, somehow because the second order equations reduce to first order equations, morally speaking, because of supersymmetry. Uh, but uh, as I um, said various times, uh, I will not go into that because I don't have time. So hopefully someone else We'll do that. Uh, so I will just take the pedestrian uh, approach of computing the full spectrum, which in this case we can do. And uh, in general, in general, uh, so one uh, just has to decompose the fields in harmonics on the space. Uh, and since this is S2, we, have, uh, we know what the harmonics are. Now, of course, our fields, uh, first of all, they have sp spin in general. So some of them are scalars, but some of them are not. So we should use harmonics for fields with spin, so sections of uh, either a spin bundle or a vector bundle, uh, sorry, ta tangent bundle, and so on. And they're also charged. So this should also be a bundle and uh, the gauge bundle. Um, but uh, luckily, in two dimensions, the spin group is abelian. And uh, moreover, everything is diagonalized, so all the background is uh, abelian uh, at the end of the day. And so essentially, we only need uh, harmonics for fields uh, which are in, uh, in, a, in a line bundle, essentially. Um, and so uh, these objects are called, uh, in the physics literature, spin spherical harmonics. Uh, so these are called uh, Y, S, J, J, 3. So uh, S uh, is the spin, but more generally it's just the charge and the, the line bundle, and uh, this J and J3 and the angular momentum on the sphere. So this uh, J and J3 are uh, integer of half integer depending on, on S. And moreover, J3 and S smaller or equal to j. And, uh, and so essentially, if you want, this, this, this s is a sort of effective spin, which contains the, the z component of the spin, but also, um, also charges under a gauge, uh, gauge bundle. So this gets a contribution from the magnetic field. Um, And uh, so these are just the eigenfunctions of the, of the Laplacian. So if you take the Laplacian, where you put both the spin connection and the gauge, uh, the various gauge connections, um, you have some eigenvalues of this operator. So this is just the standard uh, scalar spherical harmonics. If you set s equal to 0, this is precisely that. OK, and so with this, we can decompose all our fields in these harmonics. And we just have to plug in uh, and uh, take the product of all the eigenvalues. So it's very uh, uh, 
standard, it's not stra uh, straightforward computation. So let me just give you an example. So uh, uh, let's look what uh, the set of type of thing that one gets uh, for the current multiplet. Um, so what do we have to do for the current multiplet? Well, we take this, this matter action. Uh, so first of all, we look at first the bosonic sector and the fermionic sector. So the bosonic sector I wrote. And so essentially, you have to do the quadratic expansion around the background. And the operator that you get, let me call it O phi, is the following. Okay, where uh, uh, what I mean here is that you have to plug in the values of the background, right? This is the quadratic expansion. So in sigma 1 and sigma 2 and d, you, you plug in what, what the background is. Um, so in particular, the result will depend on the point where, where we are. Uh, and you just plug in all the spherical harmonics and you collect the factors. And uh, uh, what you obtain is uh, something like the following. So the details are not important. I just want to give you a flavor of the type of computations and results that one obtain, uh, just that uh, you see it once. So in particular, you, you don't have to copy these expressions. They're not particularly important. And you can find them in the papers. But the point is that you get some infinite product of eigenvalues like, uh, like this. Uh, and then, OK, one repeats uh, the same thing for the fermion, uh, for the fermion operator, which I'm not going to write because I didn't write it. The, well, I, wr I wrote it yesterday. Um, now, in this case, this is a two-component spinner. So really, you have to decompose uh, both components in terms of the spherical harmonics. And they have spin mm, one half and minus a half. Uh, yes, in this particular computation, uh, phi is a scalar. And so uh, my value for s that I'm using here is really just the magnetic flux. Um, but here I have two components, one half and minus one half. And so once again, I plug in uh, and I compute the eigenvalues. And you get some similar expression. Um, which there's really no point for me to write. Uh, well, OK, let, let, me, let me just write it to show uh, the, the, the feature that I was talking about. So the, the expression that one obtains is something like the following. So very similar. Still, there is uh, some product. Of this uh, similar. So this is a J. So as you see, it's very similar, but it's not quite the same. So most of the terms will cancel, but not all of them. And so at the end, one finds, uh, so we are interested in this super determinant, which is the ratio of the two, uh, the, the fermionic over the bosonic determinant. Uh, and this is, uh, so this will be some simplified expression, but it will still be uh, some, uh, some uh, I mean, this is not completely trivial, it's, in, it's still some infinite product. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is the expression. Now, uh, well, this expression is not well defined because this product is not convergent. And so we need to regularize it. So let me put this in quotation mark. So this is uh, telling us what the function should be, but this per se this is not a good, uh, a good uh, well, it's not convergent. So we should uh, regularize it. And for instance, we can use a zeta function regularization. Um, and so, okay, in this particular case, uh, what do we do? Well, we can use the Hurwitz uh, zeta function. This is a zeta function that depends on two parameters, z and q. And it is defined uh, in some infinite sum. And this is convergent if the real part of z is large enough. Uh, but then you can do analytic continuation and you can define it uh, in the whole complex plane out to some poles. And now, okay, so now if you take uh, this expression and you compute a certain derivative of this expression, so you take the derivative with respect to z and then you set z to zero. So formally, you obtain the following expression. Uh, which, uh, okay, up to taking the exponential is precisely the thing that we want. It's an infinite product uh, over this n for some, uh, with some shift. Uh, this shift will be this expression here, or this expression here. Uh, but in fact, uh, if, if you do it more properly, what you get is a, a log of a gamma function. Um, and so this is the regularized expression that, uh, that we associate to this, uh, well the, re the regular function that we associate to this expression. And so, uh, so because of this, so let me also say that, so here, okay, here it was, uh, okay, in this expression is like we have a single, a single mode, but of course this, this current multiple is in some representation of the gauge group, so we have as many components as the dimension of the representation. Each component is associated to a weight of the representation. And so really here there is also a product over the weights of the, of the representation. And so the full thing that I mean can call uh, Z1 loop uh, chiral, because it's for the chiral multiplet, um, is first of all a product over the way, all, all the weights in the representation and then there is a, a ratio of, uh, of gamma functions. So once again, the specific, the specific function that we get here is not important in different examples and in different dimensions, we will get different functions. The important thing is that it's a, okay, it's a, a explicit and relatively simple function. And so in general, it's not a big problem to compute in this one loop determinants. So this is not a hard part in localization. It might be technical, uh, I mean, it might take some, some time to compute it, but um, it's it's, it's usually it's not a big obstacle. Okay, so this is the result for the chiral multiplet. Now we want to do uh, something similar for the vector multiplet. Are there questions? Yes. Okay, so uh, the computation is similar. The only point that I would like to stress, uh, which is different, is that uh, um, we need to fix the gauge. Because um, we are dealing with a the gauge theory. And, uh, and we can use the standard fadef popov method. Uh, however, as this drawing, so let me make this drawing again. So we are doing, uh, so we are expanding around a certain point, a certain uh, background configuration. And so we have to do gauge fixing on a background. 
not around the, the, the zero configuration. And so, uh, so, so what we do, so as we said in the general discussion, so we take this gauge field and we separate it into uh, some background, which is essentially this uh, constant magnetic flux that we have on the sphere, uh, plus an oscillatory part. And we should perform uh, gauge fixing on this, uh, on this background. Let me also say that we don't need to do gauge fixing for the background because uh, uh, well essentially we have already done it. So when we wrote the set of BPS configurations, we say that, okay, we have to sum over magnetic fluxes. So we already were using a gauge invariant uh, description of that. Um, so we don't need to do gauge fixing for this, but we need to do gauge fixing for these oscillations. Uh, and so we do the standard thing. We add a gauge fixing action. So we introduce ghosts. C and C tilde, these are uh, scalar, these are fermionic scalar in the adjoint representation. Um, And uh, now this parameter xi, so maybe I should use a different name. Let me call it, uh, well, okay, let me use xi uh, gauge fixing. So this is not the Fayetti-Leopoulos term. This is the parameter that we're using in uh, arc C gauge. Uh, and so in particular, as a check, there should not be a dependence on this parameter at the end of the computation. Um, and this covariant derivative, the, these are computed on a background. So in this covariant derivative, you only have the background. Uh, and so in particular, this action is quadratic in the um, uh, oscillating fields, in this A hat and the, in the, in the ghosts. And so the only difference is that now we have to do, so when you expand a quadratic order, we, we compute one loop determinant, we also have to, to include this uh, and the ghosts in the, in the computation. Uh, but otherwise, is. Uh, is the very same thing. So in particular, we will use, uh, we can use superior mills plus uh, this uh, gauge fixing action. Uh, this is already quadratic and we do the same thing. And, uh, and the one loop determinant will have a similar form. So uh, there will be a contribution from the ghost. Once again, we expand all the fields in harmonics. So it will be a, computation, a contribution from the ghost, which are fermionic a contribution from the gay genie, and a contribution from uh, um, A and sigma, which are mixed together. Uh, well, here we get a square root because these are really real fields, uh, while all the other ones are complex. Um, and there are some primes here. So we get some uh, uh, zero modes. So we get some zero modes in this operator, and these zero modes will be associated to sigma. So there will be some flat direction from sigma, so we remove these zero modes and we'll have to integrate over them. You also get some zero modes from these ghosts, and in particular these zero modes correspond to uh, constant gauge transformations. These constant gauge transformations, uh, you don't have this problem in flat space, because in flat space usually you set to zero your gauge transformation at infinity. Uh, but now we are on a compact space, so we do have constant gradient transformations. Um, and uh, we know that we have to divide by them, so we can just remove these zero modes. So we know that these zero modes are just uh, related to gauge transformations. So we can either remove them by hand. If you want to be more formal, we could introduce ghost for ghost, uh, but the result will be the same. So since we understand where these zero modes come from, I will just remove them. Okay. Um, and so the expression that we get is the following. So there is a product over the roots which annihilate uh, the magnetic flux. So of course this, uh, this answer depends on where we are. And actually probably a more, uh, a better picture is, is the following. So if you want each of these slices is parameterized by A. Uh, but we have many slices because we have this M, this, 
discrete parameter. And the answer depends where we are. So, uh, so this will be a product over the roots that are, uh, th that are invariant uh, under this magnetic flux, that commute with this magnetic flux. And then you find some product of the positive roots instead of finding a product of the weights. But these are the weights of the adjoint representation. And here the function that you get is uh, even simpler than before because it's just a quadratic polynomial. OK, so we have this very simple expression. Is there any questions so far? What's the argument of the first alpha of the, in the first slide? Well, it's not an argument. I mean, you do I mean the one over, uh, I can't read it. Here? So this is 1 over absolute value, let me write it, 1 over absolute value of alpha of uh, A, sorry. Yes, alpha M is 0. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's no argument. You just do the computation, and this is what you get. And then the other alphas are also we're all alpha of A? Or? No, this is alpha positive. So you divide the roots into positive and negative. And like after that, the exponents, minus 1 to the alpha of? Alpha of M. And then it's alpha of m squared plus alpha. Uh, because, so this is a product over alpha m equal to 0. This is a product, uh, these are two different products. So uh, this is alpha of m. And this is alpha of m squared and alpha of a. Once again, the details are not particularly important. But, um, I mean, they are important for this computation, but not for the general idea. Um, uh, and, and so, so as we say, we have these zero modes, and so we should integrate over these zero modes. In particular, these zero modes uh, span the Cartan subalgebra, which commutes with the magnetic flux. So, in particular, if the magnetic flux is, to is uh, the magnetic flux is uh, diagonal, if the dia uh, magnetic flux is totally generic, all the gain values are different, then it's just broken to, if you want. Um, I don't know, un is broken to u1 to the n, and so the zero modes are only corresponds to these n directions. But if the magnetic flux is zero, then there is no breaking at all, and so the zero modes span the full un algebra, essentially because this magnetic flux lifts the, the zero modes. So if it is generic, it lifts o almost all of them. It cannot lift the ones in the, cart in the cartan because these are, uh, they are ne neutral. Uh, but if it is special, then there are more, more zero modes. In particular, if it is a zero, it doesn't lift anything. Okay? So, um, so we should integrate over these zero modes. Um, and so, uh, so what does it mean? Well, it means that we integrate over this A. So these are many as the rank of G, this A n. And you see essentially, so as uh, I said in the general discussion, these zero modes are, are nothing else than the uh, continuous direction that you have in this, in this, this space. So, we, so the, the path integral reduces to a lower dimensional space, and the, the coordinates along that are precisely the zero modes. So we have this, however, uh, for special values of m, in fact, these zero modes are, are not just the diagonal, as I say, they span the, the, um, the, the unbroken algebra. And so we should include a Vandermond determinant. And moreover, we should also divide by the residual uh, Weyl group. So when we break un, for in, well, when we get any group to the Cartan, we have a residual gauge transformation that corresponds to exchange in the Cartan, uh, but there is a gauge symmetry, so you should divide by that. So this is the Weyl group, which is uh, which leaves the magnetic flux invariant, um, and so we have this integral to do. In particular, notice that this factor will cancel with this factor. Uh, and then finally, we have to sum over all these magnetic fluxes. So we sum over this lattice 
of magnetic fluxes, which depends on the group, not just on the algebra, as I said. Uh, but once again, when we sum, we have to divide by gauge transformations, uh, sorry, by the residual gauge transformation, the, the residual vial transformations. And these are, so this is um, the total vial group divided by the vial group that leaves uh, M uh, invariant. So this is just a transformation that actually act on, uh, on, on M. And once again, there is a cancellation between this factor and this factor. So, uh, so we are ready to write the final formula. Uh, is, is there any question on, uh, on the general uh, procedure? Sir, probably this is a good question, but uh, you, you, you only fixed flux of your connection. Yes, sir. You, you, you only fixed flux, and and yes. flux, yes? But uh, why, why you don't integrate your own configuration which provides this flux? Or they are all gauge equivalent They are gauge equivalent because, so what are the gauge invariants? Well, the gauge invariant are the integral of, of the field strength, and then there are the Wilson lines. But we are on S2, there are no Wilson lines. So the only gauge invariant is the field strength. I mean, in general, the field strength is not the only gauge invariant. You should care about Wilson lines, uh, but you need some cycle. But Okay, if, if, if we use the same argument for S4, for example, yes. and with St. on S4, yes. so in this argument that we got, we got only two Gauss invariants, it's F and F square, mm -hmm. and we got no views and lines in S4. We have not? We, have, we, we don't have any views and lines on S4. Uh, yes, there are no extra gauge invariant observables associated to... So, so the only configuration, the configurations are enumerated by uh, by, by uh, numbers also? Well, no, I mean, there's not just the integral or the field strength. I mean, it's the, the, the actual, the field strength is a profile. So the instantons have a modular space, right? You can move these instantons around. Yes. But you only have to tell me, on S4, you only, may, you only have to tell me what is the field strength. You don't have to tell me an extra parameter, which is some Wilson line somewhere. Because it's completely fixed. So if you want on S4, so let's say that you, 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 you tell me what is the field strength. Okay, you specify what is the field strength as uh, f mu nu of x. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, I can start with a small Wilson line here. This Wilson line is zero because it's extremely small. I'm assuming it's smooth. And then I can make this Wilson line larger and I know how it changes because it's just the integral of the field strength. Right, when I change the Wilson line, I know that the, the variation in the Wilson line is just the integral of the field strength. Yes. And so I can, if you tell me what is the field strength, I can tell you what is the value of any Wilson line on, on, on S4. Yes. So there is no extra information. I think the information that may be missing is that F mu nu is uh, said to be constant uh, by the GPS equations on S2. Yes, no, absolutely. So. Uh, I mean, there are equations that tell us that f will be constant. In general, if you remove uh, equations, I'm saying the only gauge invariant information is in the field strength, but, but which is a full function. Yeah, thanks. Any other question? Okay, so uh, okay, we put everything together and we get we get the form um, the following expression. I, again, I write it. The details is not super important because they are specific to this. But then I will make some comments. Yes, the gauge fixing Lagrangian is too exact. Is Q exact? So you want the result map to be? Uh, I'm actually not even using one which is super symmetric. I mean, I'm not introducing partners for uh, for C. I mean, you could you do everything in a super symmetric way, uh, but uh, I mean, the only thing that I want to do is to fix the gauge. I, I don't have to do that in a super symmetric way. I, I, I could, then it would be more formal. As I said, you can also introduce ghosts for ghosts, but the result is not going to change. 
The sum over the charge to magnetic bias, is that supposed to be inside of that integral on the line above, or is that something separate you're writing? It's, uh, it's outside, because for each magnetic sector, if you want the zero modes are different. So you should have first okay, the... So you're saying first compute the above integral, then multiply it by that prefactor and sum over the magnetic fluxes. Sorry, so this integral... Uh, so, so this, so you first take the, okay, let me write the expression, it will be clear. Okay, let me, okay, let me write it, and then let's see if this is clear. And you should not copy this. I mean, this is in the papers. Uh, there's no point in OK, so this is the expression. So let, let's see if, if it makes sense. So we, are the, we, we have this, uh, well, let me repeat the drawing, we have this uh, uh, modular space of special configuration where we localize. This is a set uh, of, of sub-manifolds. So we choose a point on this uh, manifold. For each point we have an integrand, which is this thing here. This is the classical action, and this was coming from this oscillation, so this was the one-loop determinant. And then we have to integrate over these uh, submanifolds and then to sub o o o over the submanifolds. So we first integrate, and this is our integral over the submanifolds. And in fact, the zero modes that we integrate over precisely um, parameterize these manifolds. Uh, and then we have a sum over the various manifolds, which is a sum over magnetic fluxes. And of course, here we are still using a description which is gauge redundant because there is the Weyl group that acts, so we divide by the dimension of the Weyl group. Uh, does this make sense? Does this answer your uh, question? Okay. okay. So, um, so let's comment on this. So the first comment is that, uh, um, okay, I don't know what you think, but this expression is extremely simple. So after all, we are computing, uh, so this is an exact evaluation of, a non-perturbative evaluation of a, of a path integral. So the fact that we have some, such a simple expression is, is quite interesting. And of course, this is a common a theme in these localization computations. One is able to find exact expression, which is relatively simple. Uh, after all, it's just an integral that, okay, I mean, if you want, you can even do it numerically. Uh, and then there is a sum. Um, you can do it numerically. Um, so it's a very simple expression. In fact, as we say, so this is an exact non-perturbative result. Uh, so, so in particular, it should contain, I mean, there should be all the instanton uh, corrections. Uh, so you might ask, okay, where are the instantons? Uh, and uh, uh, if you wish, this is, um, in fact, this expression is, 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 is a bit different from what you get, for instance, on, on S4, as Wolf can explain, because in that case, you also have to include all non-perturbative corrections that you need to compute in some other way. 
Uh, but here we don't find uh, extra non-perturbative corrections. So um, in some sense, it might seem like this is just perturbative. At the end of the day, we just put in these, these one loop uh, determinants, which are computed perturbatively. So, uh, so what about the instantons? Uh, and the point is that, in fact, this expression does already contain the instantons. So they are not manifest from here, but it does, it does contain them. And uh, one way to see, uh, but uh, we will be more specific in a, in a, in a moment, uh, is the following. So this is an integral over some real lines. So let me consider the rank one case, um, like it was u1. So this is an integral over the real line. So this is the plane A. Uh, of course, there is also this sum over the magnetic fluxes. And we integrate along this, this, this real line. So uh, how do we do this integral? Well, one way is to do the Cauchy trick. So we close the contour at infinity. Of course, we have to make sure that there's no contribution if this circle is large enough. And you can check that this is the case. You will have to choose one of the two sides. Um, that's OK. So then you have this contour integral. And so this contour integral reduces to a sum over residues. And if you, so here there are gamma functions. Uh, the gamma function doesn't have any zero, but it has poles, so you get poles from here. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, okay, taking into account all the sum of the magnetic fluxes, you discover that uh, um, if you wish, at this point, you can bring the sum in because there is no, uh, no. because this integration uh, contour does not depend on M. And so what we discovered, there is a, a sort of um, rank to lattice. It's not really a lattice, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a wedge. Uh, but essentially, there is a sort of um, um, yeah, sort of wedge of, of poles. And so you can reduce the computation to computing residues around these poles and, and summing the residues. And uh, well, as we will see better in a, in a moment, it turns out that in fact each of these residues is an instanton contribution. And so we can rewrite this expression as a sum of our instanton contributions. Okay? Um, what do you mean by instanton? Yes, so uh, if you have pure gauge theory, uh, in two dimensions there are no instantons. But uh, um, if you have a gauge theory with matter and you go on the X branch, uh, there are vortices, and vortices are the instantons in two, in two dimensions. Well, these are non perturb If you want, these are uh, uh, solutions to the e Euclidean equations of motion with finite uh, action. <coughs> OK, so we will see this in a moment. Um, well, we will start see seeing it. OK. Uh, Sorry, but is that vortex satisfying some circularity relation? No, it's a vortex equation, which is a different equation. It's just a soliton. Uh, it is a, well, it's a, in three dimensions, it's a soliton. So if you add time, so this is the standard story. If you have an instanton in, some, in dimension d, you can go in d plus one dimensions and becomes a soliton. Uh, so the vortex becomes a vortex uh, particle in three dimensions, uh, while it is an instant on in two dimensions. So these are the very same vorti vortices uh, that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the particle vortex duality, or, uh, sorry? The one in 3D with electrons? Yeah. Yes. So there are, uh, you can have, uh, well, the, the vortices are solitons, so there are vortex particles. Uh, there are also, well, in four dimensions, there are, there are vortex strings, and they play a role in uh, superconductivity. Uh, they distinguish between type 1 and type 2 superconductivity, so they are very. The very same vortices. Um, OK, so, so, uh, so let's continue with this comment. So here we uh, computed just the pure uh, partition function. 
But in fact, one might be interested in insertions, operator insertions. And in fact, it turns out that there are, uh, so it's easy to make uh, insertion of order operators. For instance, we can insert uh, a twisted chiral field set at one point of the sphere and anti-twisted chiral field set at the other point of the sphere. So here we can include some sigma or more generally some function of sigma, uh, gauge invariant, and here some other function of, but of sigma tilde at the uh, antipodal point. And, uh, um, and it's easy to include in the localization because uh, essentially you just have these functions appearing in the um, integrand. Uh, and so this is already an example of what I said at the beginning. So this is not a holomorphic correlator because this is holomorphic, this is anti-holomorphic. So if you wish, this is a type of correlator which uh, um, you do not access with the topological twist. So this is different from uh, what was done in the, in the past. Uh, and in fact, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, these correlators are quite interesting. And I think next week, uh, Komargotsky will talk about this in four dimensions instead of two. But essentially, there is a um, same, same, same story. Uh, it's also easy to include the Wilson line operators. It turns out that you can insert the Wilson line operators along some, um, uh, this is called parallel. So here you can have some Wilson line that depends on some arbitrary representation R. And once again, this is very easy to include. Essentially, you have uh, just another uh, exponential in your integrand, and so you can compute them. And once again, this is very similar to Peston computation then. Um, one can also include uh, uh, other type, the other type of operators, uh, for instance, disorder operators. Of course, these are more complicated because then you need to change, so, uh, change your boundary condition, integrate over a different set of uh, fields because now the fields will be, there will be singular points with singular boundary conditions. So you have to repeat the computation, but this can be done. Um, and for instance, uh, Takuya Okuda, who is here, did uh, these uh, sort of computations. So you can ask him if you're interested. Um, okay. So I will not discuss this. Yes. So you say it's an untwisted theory. Yes. And uh, yet, in the final expression for the partition function, I don't see any ex uh, explicit dependence on the form of the superpotential. Yes. Um, uh, I, I don't how, know how to reconcile those two, reconcile those two facts because I would imagine that an untrusted theory would also depend on the form that uh, the superpotential takes. Right? Yes, so the, the full theory, of course, depends on everything. So if you take a generic operator and you compute correlation function of generic operators, those correlation functions will depend on everything. But we are either computing, so here we just computed the part integral on the sphere with no insertion, so just the partition function. Uh, that particular computation does not depend on the superpotential. Um, in fact, if you, well, and, the, and the also as I said, you can compute more generally these correlation functions, for instance, of twisted and anti-twisted, but these are very special correlation functions. So those objects do not depend on the superpotential, but a generic correlator does. And we don't know how to compute those generic correlators in the strongly coupled theory. Any other question? Do you have a <coughs> Bill's alive from two comma two is or Yes. Just a like uh body and construct similar, yes. So you have to if I remember correctly, you have to integrate A and then there is also sigma. And they have to combine. There will be some condi I don't remember the conditions, but there is some condition. OK. Um, then let me just say that if one study 3D n equal to theory on uh, uh, so gauge theory on uh, uh, S3, things are very similar. Uh, of course, the details are different, the type of function that you get are different. You don't get the sum over magnetic fluxes, only the integral, but otherwise the same uh, uh, 
philosophy and the, the expression is extremely similar. Um, so one could leave this as an exercise, <laughs> <laughs> but you can find it on papers. So. Uh, but let me stress once again, instead, uh, the, the, the computation in, in four dimensions in these respects are, are, are different. I mean, there is a qualitative difference uh, that actually in the integrand, you need to put all the non-perturbative uh, corrections, but not all, but in the sense you have to put non the contribution for non-perturbative corrections that you have to compute in some other way. And so this makes the computations in, like on S4 or in five dimensions more complicated, we can say much more complicated. Uh, I don't know, 4D as 4 uh, requires instantons. Um, okay, and then let me stress once again something that we said before, that this computation does not depend on the RG flow or more precise, does not depend on the, on the scale of the set by the gauge coupling. And so in particular, uh, something which is, uh, I mean, a setup which is particularly useful is a setup in which we, sta we start with some uh, uh, gauge linear sigma model in the UV. So gauge linear sigma model is just a gauge theory. And for instance, we can take a gauge theory of vector and chiral multiplets. And we have a formula for the partition function. Now, this gauge, uh, gauge linear sigma model may flow in the infrared to a nonlinear sigma model. Um, and in particular, this is particularly interesting if this nonlinear sigma model is conformal. Uh, because then there is no uh, non unitary deformation, and what we compute really knows about the physical theory uh, in the infrared. And so this uh, can become a very efficient way to compute quantities in uh, nonlinear sigma models. Um, and uh, um, but this is very useful in general, but in particular, for instance, it is very useful for the string, because the string is a two-dimensional theory. And if you compactify the string, for instance, on some Calabi-Yau, there is a sector of the, of the worksheet theory, which is a nonlinear sigma model on the Calabi-Yau. And if we can realize this Calabi-Yau with a non-gauge linear sigma model, we can use this formula to compute things about the string on these, um, on these manifolds. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna move to the next topic. So if there are extra questions, this is a good time. So the next thing I would like to talk uh, about is uh, to clarify uh, this story of uh, how the instantons are uh, included in this, in this expression and uh, how, uh, yes, so how this expression knows about the instantons and uh, how can we understand this in a more um, abstract way. And so in particular, this is related to, uh, well, I don't remember if this question was posed in this, in this school, but uh, okay, uh, a natural question one could have is, uh, so there are various choices that we have to do in this localization computation. In particular, we have to choose this localizing term. Uh, what if we choose a different term? Are things going to change or, or, or not? Uh, of course, the final result as a function must not depend on it, otherwise uh, it means that uh, we are doing something wrong. Because localization is just a way to compute the original path integral. Uh, however, uh, we, we might obtain some different expression uh, for the same quantity. So uh, let's suppose that we add, uh, besides the two terms we were adding before, we add a new localization term. Um, Uh, let me call this uh, LH. 
And I will not, okay, I will not write this, this term uh, uh, with the, I mean, with the full details, because once again, the details are not uh, so important, but this term looks like the following. Uh, here, probably I should put a tilde in the notation that I'm using here, uh, plus my many other terms. Uh, and this is a Q-exact term. So we want to add a localization term. So it's something Q-exact. I'm not going to write what uh, is Q of what. I'm not going to write all the terms. Uh, but the important thing is that, uh, so in this term, there is a constant. So this chi is a number. And uh, of course, since this goes into a localization term, there will not be a, a dependence on this constant at the end of the day. So I can choose this constant, whatever I want. It's controlled by some constant that appear here. Uh, and, and then you see that, OK, this term looks a little bit like a D term. Uh, sorry, like a Fayetiliopoulos term. Uh, because the Fayetiliopoulos term precisely is, uh, is a D chi. So there is a, a Fayetiliopoulos term. But of course, it's not just the Fayetiliopoulos term, because as we commented before, the final path integral, uh, the partition function, does depend on the physical Fayetiliopoulos term. So let me make it more explicit. How many is written there? Uh, I don't know if you can. So you see that the physical Fayetiliopoulos term was this psi, and the, the, the final expression does depend on psi. Uh, this one is a sort of. Uh, no, Fayetiliopoulos term dressed with other stuff in such a way that there is no dependence on it. Um, but uh, it looks like a, a Fayetiliopoulos term. Um, now, uh, well, this action is not uh, positive uh, semi definite. Um, and, uh, okay, it's not manifest from here. So here there is, th this is uh, the imaginary part, but if you take the full expression that you can find in the papers and you see what is there, this is not uh, uh, positive definite. So it looks like this is not good. However, uh, D appears in the action just uh, without derivatives and quadratically. So there is no problem in doing the path integral over D. We can do it by hand without localization. And if we do the path integral by hand over D, uh, the expression that we find is positive definite. So if you do this piece of the integral by hand, then we can apply the localization argument afterwards. And uh, if we uh, integrate out of this d, once again, since this is an auxiliary field, just means that we substitute d by the value that it gets by the equations of motion, which are just algebraic, and this is the reason why we can do the substitution. And in fact, one gets uh, the following equation. Uh, which correctly does not contain derivatives, and d is just linear. So, uh, so this is why we can just substitute uh, the equation of motion to the action. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this, uh, it precisely looks like the D-term equation. Um, but with, uh, with, um, with a Fayetiliopoulos term. Um, and, uh, and the nice thing is that uh, if we, uh, I mean, if we are in two dimensions and we turn on a Fayetiliopoulos term and we look at uh, what happens to the modular space, uh, the vacua are, are, are moved to the X branch. And on the X branch, there are vortices. And so we might expect that now somehow the localization locus is moved uh, to a sort of X, to something that looks like the X branch in, in, in flat space. Uh, and so the configurations that matter are vortices. Uh, by contrast, if you want, the configuration that we're contributing there looks more like a Coulomb branch uh, in flat space, uh, because essentially we integrate over uh, this sigma. The sigma was the scalar in the vector multiplet, and when we turn it on, we break the gauge group to the, uh, the, the Cartan, and this is what happens on the Coulomb branch. Okay? So in fact, some, uh, sometimes this formula is called the uh, Coulomb branch localization formula. Uh, 
Uh, but here it looks like uh, we might uh, localize uh, to something uh, different. So, uh, okay, I don't have much time, so we're not, once again, going to the full details. If you're interested, you can ask me or you can look in the, in the papers. But now that you impose this constraint, now you go and solve the BPS equations and uh, um, uh, the solution to the BPS equations are different than before. And uh, uh, okay, you might ask, I mean, why the BPS equations are different, right? The BPS equations uh, do not depend on the, on the, on the action. Uh, and of course, you are correct. The point here is that uh, uh, so when you go to, when we go to Euclidean, we have these BPS e equations, and they are for complexified fields. And so there are lots of solutions which are general complex solutions. And in general, uh, we don't write also. I mean, this is, this, is, this is complicated. However, then we restrict to a real contour, uh, and then there is just a subset of the of the of the solution. So in particular, when I wrote those uh, those solutions. Those were the zeros of the real part of the actions, which if you go to the BPS equations, those are the restriction of the complexified BPS equation to some real contours. So it's a subset of the solutions. <laughs> and somehow, imposing these constraints is changing uh, the real contour, but it's only changing it for the D term, for the auxiliary field. So after all, it's not, it's not a big change, because anyway, it's non-dynamical, uh, but still, uh, it changes the reality condition, and then you get some other subset of the complexified BPS equations, uh, which is gonna, um, I'm going to tell you. So this is how you can get different set of BPS uh, solutions. The full set of BPS solutions is, uh, well, I, I, I don't know what it is, but it's very, it's very large, very complicated. Or maybe it's not, I don't know, but it's, I've not studied it. <laughs> or I don't think uh, anybody has studied it. Uh, is there any question on this point? Okay. So, so, so what happens is the following: that uh, uh, um, so, so, so we can imagine the, the what would be the, the the Coulomb branch on flat space, uh, the classical Coulomb branch. Uh, so this is parameterized by this a, and there are special points. On this, on this would be Coulomb branch in flat space, or classical Coulomb branch in flat space, where x branches open up. And these points are points where one of the chiral multiplets become massless. Uh, so these chiral multiplets have uh, masses because there are twisted masses into the game, but uh, twisted masses can be offset by moving on the Coulomb branch. And so at special points, one of the chiral multiplets becomes massless. And those are the points where the x branch open up. Uh, um, of course, in the x branch, you give VEV to, to the sum of the chiral multiplets, and so they better be massless if you want to, to give them VEV. Uh, and in fact, in the BPS equation, you find uh, things like sigma 1 minus m phi equal to sigma 2 phi equal to 0, where this uh, m, I should use a different letter, um, maybe I can use capital M. So where these are the twisted masses. And in fact, now I realize I didn't tell you how the twisted masses enter in that formula. Uh, uh, so let me just uh, say that. So, so in this formula, I set all the twisted masses to zero for simplicity. But you understand how the twisted masses appear. Because twisted masses are expectation values for the scalars in background vector multiplet. So they are exactly on the same footing as this A. Uh, so if you turn on the twisted masses, you also have some other contribution, which is the same as this A. This on the only difference is that A is dynamical, and so it's integrated over. The twisted masses are not dynamical, so they're not integrated over, and there will be some parameters at the end of the day. Okay? But otherwise, they appear in exactly in the same, the same way.
So you find these uh, type of equations. Uh, and so uh, this is what I described before. So if, uh, so if you have a mass, of course, the field should be 0 because it's massive. But on special points of the Coulomb branch, uh, some of the components, because of course this is a, a diagonal matrix in uh, gauge, in, in the Cartano, in, uh, in um, the, 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 the algebra, the gauge algebra, well, this is, uh, if you want, this is a diagonal matrix in the flavor algebra. Uh, but you, you can have a conspiracy in which some, some component cancel out, and that component th then can, can get a valve, right? Because this, this equation allows for phi to get a valve. So these are precisely these special points where sigma 1 minus m has uh, some, z, uh, some vanishing uh, eigenvalue. And then, uh, and then, okay, you find uh, um, some other uh, equations. Now, these equations involve, so these are differential equations that involve this chi, okay? And we, uh, once again, since there is no dependence on this chi, we can take a limit in which chi goes to infinity. Okay, well, too late. We can take a limit in which chi goes to infinity. And so I will just describe the type of solution that you obtain when chi is very large. Uh, but I mean, there is some differential equations for finite chi, and one can study this differential equation. Uh, so I take the limit uh, uh, in which chi goes to plus or minus infinity. And the type of solution that you get is the following. So we have the S2. And, uh, um, and so outside, so there are two special points, which are the poles. These two special points are selected by the particular Q that you chose, because this Q is made of uh, two uh, epsilon and epsilon tilde. And you, you can look at what are the zeros of this epsilon and epsilon tilde, of some components of them. So there are two special points. And uh, um, outside of the points, Essentially, this equation forces you on the x branch. So you have that the field strength uh, is 0, and phi phi tilde is equal to chi. And this is precisely what you have on the x branch. So phi takes a VEV, and the VEV is controlled by this, uh, we can call it fake uh, phi Etiopolis term, in the sense that it's not the physical one. However, if we go close to the poles, uh, then we have some non-trivial uh, uh, differential equation. So if you want, this is similar to what happens um, in Preston's case on, on S4. Uh, but with the difference that I will remark. So we get this equation. Uh, OK, so this plus or minus, I think, depends on whether we are at the North Pole or the South Pole. So in one case, you get a plus and you get the minus. And this d plus minus, maybe I should call them uh, the z, z bar. Uh, these are uh, holomorphic uh, derivatives. So maybe I should call it either z bar or, or, or z, depending on the, on the two. Uh, and so these equations are equations which are known in physics and, and mathematics, and these are called uh, vortex equations. Um, so, 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 so as we said before, uh, these equations are, so the solutions are essentially instantons, so you can study, yes. You can study this equation on flat space, and you can think of them as instantons. The difference is that the instantons in four dimensions are equations only for the field strength. In two dimensions, if you just write equation for the field strength, you don't get something non-trivial. You need equation for the field strength and some uh, scalar field. So this is what you have in these vortex equations. Um, 
And so, um, yes, and so, and so now, what you localize on, well, okay, you will have some finite sum over these x branches, but this is just a finite sum. It's not particularly, we can think that there is a single x branch. It's not an important point. The important point is that now we have to include all configurations which uh, solve, yes. Oh, I was just wondering, what's the relation between the, off the side, those are the vortex equations, so those are the non-particular configuration, but the equations you wrote under Higgs branch, f1 is equal to 0, pi pi tilde equals pi, is that just giving an onslaught to solve the vortex equations? Uh, yeah, this is the behavior of, uh, if you want, of the solution far from, uh, far from the core of the vortex. Oh, the, the asymptotic behavior. So, yes. oh, so taking the sphere to be big enough to, so that you can say, okay, it looks like flat space at each pole? Or, or yeah, so the point is that, so if you take this equation, of course the vortices have a module that corresponds to moving them. Also? Uh, the, 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 the core of the vortex. Uh, but really, the vortices here are, are uh, confined to the poles. They are in an omega background, essentially. And are you saying those are all, that all solutions have that form asymptotically, or that that's in kind of an easy class to construct? Uh, no, all of them has. Uh, up to the, so if you go far from the uh, core of the vortex, so the vortex solution looks like the following. So there will be a core. Uh, the field strength is as a bump around the core, so this is the field strength. And then the field strength goes to zero, uh, I think exponentially, far from the vortex. And so if the field strength goes to zero, you see this is constrained to be zero. So this is, so the field strength is zero. This just comes from solving the equation. You see that it goes to oh, zero exponentially. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then this follows. Uh -huh. So if you want phi, it goes something opposite. Phi is zero at the core, essentially because phi winds. So close to the core, phi goes like um, r. Well, essentially, this goes like z to the n, where n is the, uh, let me call it k, the vortex number. Uh, so phi winds, the, the phase of phi winds as you go around. It winds infinity? Yes, at infinity, if you count the number of windings, this is the vortex number. It's a topological uh, conserved charge. And so since it winds, it has to go to zero at the origin to be smooth. So this goes to zero, and then when you go far from the uh, origin, it goes to the value, okay, phi equal to square root of uh, chi. Uh, which is the value, so far from the vortex, you are on the x branch, uh, but then in the core of the vortex, um, it behave like, like, like this. Yes, in fact, uh, it's nice how this is uh, related to superconductivity because uh, so when you are in the X branch, um, you know, X mechanism is uh, superconductivity essentially. Uh, the photon is uh, massive and the magnetic field cannot penetrate. Uh, but when, when you have a vortex, uh, this breaking parameter goes to zero, so the mass of the um, photon goes to zero, and, and then the magnetic field can, uh, can form a tube that goes through. The, I mean, the vortex is a tube of magnetic flux that goes into the superconductor. Okay. So there is this, uh, some actual uh, real-world physics in this. Uh, anyway, um, of course, also in instantons. <laughs> um, Okay, um, yes, the, the only, okay, the only difference, so here I'm uh, uh, a bit simplifying the equations in this limit, because uh, the only difference with, uh, um, with uh, uh, Peston case is that, uh, so somehow in Peston case, you have these uh, point-like -like instantons at the poles of the, of the S4, it will be, if you would like to be completely, oh yeah, my time is over. Uh, let me just finish this, this sentence. So if you would like to be completely um, precise, you will need to do what the Nekos did in flat space. So you will need to do uh, probably some non-commutative deformation and open up the, the, the instantons to smooth configurations. Still in Peston setup, these are not smooth, right? These are really point-like. 
Uh, and I don't think that this has been done on S4. Um, I think everybody believes that it's going to work. Um, uh, but here, you, there is a parameter that you can tune. And when chi is finite, you, are, you actually have a smooth uh, solutions. And then in the limited chi is going to infinity, they become the standard vortex equations. In general, there are some smooth deformation of these equations. So in some sense, here you already have the deformation that makes the, all the configuration smooth. Um, but otherwise, it's very similar. OK, so you, we, we will continue tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>